I think we can start. With some water. Ah, thank you. Yeah, have mine. <laughs> I said take mine. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone. Oh, that's so loud. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's gonna be better. Uh, thanks so much for coming here uh, to this session just after lunch, and uh, especially considering that there are there have been uh, a couple of panels touching this topic of a, uh, about AI and news and journalism and media and so on. So thanks so much. Um, I'd like to know what are you expecting from this panel? If you can raise your hands, please. Someone that wants, uh, yeah? <laughs> In the newsroom, okay. maybe that's, that's a winner. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Something else? <laughs> so, uh, but maybe okay. just one question from our end, because if we say AI in the newsroom is bad, who would raise the hand then? Is it bad? So that means all of you are in favor of this. It's more like a two, which cannot be dangerous. Ah, okay. But it's not only bad, it can be both, no? Okay, good one. Uh, then. I'll start. Uh, so uh, I'm Esther Paniagua. I am a journalist, a science and tech journalist. Um, as a tech journalist, I'm not interested in gadgets and so on, but about technologies that matter. Uh, one of them, of course, is artificial intelligence. That is not new, but is kind of like much more important now because of uh, um, the rise of big data and computing like capacity and so on. So um, AI uh, is something that every journalist is likely to cover, even if they are not specialized in technology or science, because AI is permeating all areas of our lives and every sector. And in media and journalism, is helping to automatize boring, repetitive, and non-added value tasks, which is very good, and give us journalists more time for in-depth stories, for investigative pieces, for analysis, and, and so on. So uh, transcriptions, as you may know, is and translation as well is one of the are one of the the tasks that can be automatized that are being automatized. Guido will let let us more know more about it, um, and also um, reporting on factual um, uh, like factual reporting. Sorry, for instance, in finance news, sports news, as the Wall Street Journal or <coughs> Bloomberg are doing, and and a few more. Uh, the Washington Post has a board that is called Eliograph, you may know it. Um, this board uh, produced in its first time, uh, uh, year of time 850 pieces, and it, it, it received an award because of the great coverage of the general elections in the US in 2016. Uh, and, and what the Post, the Washington Post says, is that they are not creating this board for replacing journalists, but for helping uh, them, for helping us, uh, to do our job faster and easier. Um, the, the, the board, uh, Heliograph, it can detect trends in finance and big data, so it gives ideas to, to reporters, to journalists, to, to write about which is good, of course, more ideas. Um, there are also a few more newspapers having this, both like uh, LA Times, they use it for reporting on earthquakes based on US geological survey, and also in, in homicides. Um, of course, in Europe, we have got examples. Um, I'm not sure you have got in Deutsche Welle abroad, but, but you, you will tell us more about your case, and maybe in Germany, if you know. Um, 
And also in Spain, we have got El Confidencial, and I don't, I'm not sure if El Diario is doing that as well. Uh, they, have, they are exploring the use of bots for sports and finance news. Um, and here we have got Eduardo, which is going to talk about PolitiBot, a political bot that he has created, and he's the co-founder. Um, and well, another use of AI uh, for in the newsroom is for content um, um, monitoring and also for helping fact-checking and verification. Uh, Clara from Maldita is going to tell us more about it. Um, well, yesterday um, there was a panel by by a Facebook representative, and he was explaining that, of course, they are working on it. They have a machine learning uh, tool for trying to find hoaxes in their platform. Um, but not everything is positive. Uh, there are downsides from, uh, like, AI in the news ecosystem, uh, of course, you all know about misinformation, malicious bots, uh, the use of targeted advertisements uh, for trying to manipulate people, filter bubbles, and, and all of this. Uh, so it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, it can be, it can be, things. I think it's, can, it's not, too close nice. Yeah. So it can be a problem. It can AI can create problem problems, but it can be used for solving the problems or at least help solving the problems it creates. Um, so it can help us uh, help us and uh, make our lives harder as well. Um, in this panel, we will talk about this. We will put more examples. We will go in the and we will also discuss about about risks and ethical concerns, for instance, about not having a human uh, behind, behind the news, or for being transparent, because you have, I mean, readers, the audience, they have to know that if they are watching or you know, reading a piece of news that it has been produced by a machine, I think it's the right. So we will discuss it, um, and, and as well as other dangers. The Guardian reported recently that a uh, tech automat automatic text producer <coughs> developed by OpenAI, which is uh, an organization funded by Elon Musk and others, they um, decided not to release this um, autom <coughs> automatic text um, producer because it was so good that they were afraid of people misusing it. So we have to consider that because it's true that uh, technology can be used for purposes that was not um, created for. Um, so yeah. We will talk about this uh, in this panel. I won't take longer with my introduction. Um, so now that we have provided some, some context, I'm gonna introduce you to the premium speakers we have got here. Um, they all have impressive CVs, so I recommend you to visit the Sessions website and take a look more in depth because we don't have time to, to quote I mean, your long, impressive CV. So we have got um, on my right, Eduardo Suarez, co-founder of PolitiBot and a lot of more things. Um, Clara Jimenez, which is the co-founder of Maldita, uh, the banking fact-checking uh, organization in Spain. And she is also editor in Maldita. And um, we have got Guido, Bomb I yes, have got perfect. problems with yes. your surname, <laughs> which is the managing director of Deutsche Welle in Germany. Welcome all, and um, we will start like introducing yourselves and telling what is your re re the relationship with AI. Sorry, <laughs> um, Eduardo. Okay, yeah. I can start. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Esther, for the invitation and welcome. Um, yeah. Um, Basically, what um, I think I'm here for is to tell a little bit about PolitiBot. Um, it is a chatbot that we created in 2016 for the general election in Spain. Um, it got like uh, thousands of followers on Telegram first and then on Facebook Messenger um, uh, for that election coverage. It was the second election in a row after six months, so everybody was kind of fed up with politics in Spain. But uh, people found it like kind of 
exciting to follow the election with another uh, kind of coverage. So we created PolitiBot as an experiment, as I said, in May, June 2016. Um, at first, um, it was a very simple proposition. We didn't even have a CMS or an easy way to create the conversations. Um, the bot had uh, kind of three different um, sections. One of them was the daily conversations that we sent, and it was basically decision trees that we sent uh, to our users. They could advance through the conversations through, through buttons. So it was not a, a natural language conversation, but just advancing um, about, uh, through the conversation with these buttons. We basically sent uh, charts about the election, uh, focusing on social science and public policy. Uh, we also sent um, accurate content from other news organizations and sent um, the best articles that could describe a problem or a policy of the candidates. Um, so that was one of the parts. We also have another section, another part of the bot, who was more uh, what we would call AI or natural language processing in this regard. Uh, we started doing that at the beginning, um, trying to get answers of, uh, to the questions that our readers were doing. Uh, I have to say that we weren't successful in that part. People got confused use, often uh, when using the chatbot. So we still have some part that is natural language processing, but we have been focusing uh, uh, ever since on the other part, on the more uh, structured conversation. And the reason for that is because uh, we think that our users are used to the, to the way that we do those conversations, and it's kind of less confusing. They found it useful. We try to explain um, a topic in depth every day. And um, we try them to learn something they don't know about uh, every day with these conversations. And well, it, is, it has been kind of successful, I think. Um, the other thing that we did before launching the vote, the vote in 2016 is um, try to create a personality for it, even if it was created by all the conversations were created by, by us. We wanted to uh, create a character, like in a theater or something. So we decided that, the, that this chatbot, for example, was a fan of uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the US president. He was also always like saying these kind of things. He was a little bit cocky, but at the same time was kind of funny and tried to send you gifts and things like that. And I think that was kind of successful. It was part of the things that make PolitiBot successful. And, um, it was also very interesting to see the kind of relationship that uh, the bot got uh, to, with some of the readers. We got many messages saying, we love you, PolitiBot, we want to get married with you, or things <laughs> like that, which was kind of funny. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and that's more or less what we do. I mean, after uh, that first experience, we created a company. We got uh, two rounds of funding from Google DNI uh, Fund. And we have developed a proper, um, a proper CMS to create the conversations. And um, yeah, I can tell you uh, later if you want uh, the things that we are focusing on now and we're working on that, but maybe for the next, uh, for the next uh, talk. Okay, perfect. Then, then uh, what, is, what is automatized in, this, hmm. in your world? Well, we basically automatize the conversations but uh, in the sense that um, we send it to what we uh, call a states machine. Uh, we send the whole conversation there, and if you, receive, or you, if you receive the conversation now, you do it now, and the machine sends you the messages that we prepare uh, beforehand. But if Widow uh, receives the conversation a couple of uh, hours after that, he does the conversation at that time, and you know, we, we have to be careful with that, especially with Telegram, because Telegram has a limit uh, for the kind of users that can use the, the, the bot at the same time, so it could create some problems with the UX, but we kind of solved that, well, through some technical uh, tools, and now it's working, I think, more or less okay. Our users are satisfied. We also have a membership uh, program with uh, kind of uh, some hundreds of, of users that pay uh, for PolityBot, not for any transactional uh, thing, but just to support the project because uh -huh. they perceive it. Or to get it. married to the bot, maybe. Oh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. We haven't uh, got any marriages yet, but uh, who knows, you know. Who knows? <laughs> so, so the human part has been more important uh, than 
of course, the AI part, but as you said, not, not, not because I mean to, to yes. say that. Yes, yes, and actually, uh, one of the things that are, we are doing right now is try to transform what was or used to be like a more neutral voice uh, from the robot. Um, we are trying to substitute that uh, with conversations with real journalists. So real journalists are um, uh, sharing what they know about different topics through the chatbot. And we actually did one of those experiments with Clara and the guys at Maldita uh, when they were doing their crowdfunding, uh, just you know, trying to do a quiz uh, um, with our users so, you know, so, so they can kind of guess if some of the misinformation going around was actually true or not. Um, we try to do those kind of games because it's, it's a great environment to do games and to do quizzes because you are all, always answering, asking and answering questions. It's a good, very good environment to try to be more playful uh, with the kind of content that you do. And that's something that we would like to try also in the next few months. Okay, that's interesting. Then, Clara, the table is yours. <laughs> Um, well, I run a fact-checking organization in Spain, and we have ex had some experiences with artificial intelligence. Not good experiences, actually. This is like the deceiving part of artificial intelligence on this side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> we've done uh, two different things. One, we've, we are actually right now working with a, with a company on content monitoring. Um, the thing about that is that where you're actually, what you would monitor, like the only thing that you can actually monitor is Twitter, and Twitter in Spain has 4.7 million users. So it's not really where the people are actually talking, and it's not where disinformation is running. What the, the way we discovered that we could actually get uh, the disinformation that we needed to fact check much earlier was by basically opening a WhatsApp channel and having our users send us whatever they found on their phones, basically crowdsourcing in a very manual, old school way somehow, because we actually talk to each user that sends us something, and that's 250 uh, messages a day, which drives us kind of crazy some days. But we didn't find any other way of doing it, and since WhatsApp is not willing to open its API for fact checkers to build into it and to build natural language processing tools within their API, we, there's nothing we can do about it, basically. Um, the other way in which we use fact-checking, and it's not great yet, I think, is uh, when we fact-check politicians, basically uh, listening to them. What we did in the past was we listened to them all day long and picked up whatever we were to fact check. Right now, we actually have a machine that picks the sentences by itself and tells that, okay, I think you could fact check this. It doesn't work extremely well because it's Spanish. <laughs> and that's the other big drama with artificial intelligence yet. It works very well in English. Full Fact has a similar tool and they do marvelous things with them with it they've also been working with it a long time but when you build it in spanish it doesn't work so well and furthermore we got chequeados tool which speaks argentinian spanish and is trained by argentinians so when we got that to spain there was another uh labs that we need to train so we are doing that right now but it's not extremely useful at the moment i think that in the future it will take us some time out uh, of our processes. Maybe there'll be politicians that we don't need to listen to because they're not extremely important and we can simply refer to whatever the machine has extracted. But there still always has to be a journalist there. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's almost always the, the conclusion. This morning there was a talk by, by a representative by, uh, from Bloomberg. He was talking about it and uh, he said, in, in every case, the conclusion is you need a human being in the loop. But even, even though it's helping them to, to do quickest uh, job, get some insights and, and so on, I think in your case the main problem is language and, and maybe um, also like more um, advanced technology for developing this kind of, this kind of tools. But it's good to know these limitations uh, that 
I guess there are uh, Italians here in the room, so I, I guess with Italian, it's going to be a huge problem as well, because what? All the dialects that they yeah. have in this country, uh, which is a problem in Spain too sometimes. And, and as Clara said before, some of the tools that you use for natural language processing um, are created in English, and you can do some kind of translation, and we try to do that with some of them at the beginning, but it's not always easy, it's not always seamless uh, as it is in English mm -hmm. sometimes. I don't know, if, at least in our experience, yeah. So let's hear more positive uh, examples, or maybe not. <laughs> no, no, of course. I mean, as you yeah. all understand, this is a holiday panel, right? I'm the German, and here are three people from Spain. So <laughs> the table is Mallorca, and I put my towel right here to make sure I get the best seat. Yeah, um, not the best weather. So just a quick question. Who of you, now raise your hands again, please. Who of you knows what Deutsche Welle is, DW? Good, so I'll make this very short. So you know we do... 30 languages, content in 30 languages. So if you have issues with Spanish in Latin America versus Spanish being spoken in Spain, imagine you would do Amharic, Pashto, Dari, and Urdu uh, next to Arabic and Chinese and try to mix and max match that with other languages like, well, German and uh, English and, and easier languages, so to speak. Um, what is it that we do at Deutsche Welle where we produce this content? We do have a couple of bots out there, uh -huh. a chat bot, quiz bot, Basically playing around with this in, in Portuguese, we have a speech assistant uh, and, and, and well, you know at uh, using using Alexa, which is uh, well still disturbing some people because simply they don't like the voice and they say the quality is good, the voice is bad, so it's a couple of issues that, that come to that. Um, am I an, an expert on AI? Not at all. I guess no one really is as yet. I think we're all struggling and trying to figure out what do we do with it, uh, what is the best way to use it, how does it how does it help us? Um, so at Deutsche Welle, what we did is we set up um, a team, a research team, very early days. So the RECOs, Research and Cooperation Team. <laughs> and they do a brilliant job in trying to figure out what is, what is out there in the market, which is not usable right now, but might be useful uh, in, in just a couple of, of, of years. So we have a verification tool that we have developed, which is called Truly Media. And here we use, we have implemented AI in it in a way, but the main idea is to collaborate all over the world, worldwide, people can just do fact-checking, debunk, uh, debunk fake. Is it and for, for images, text, videos? Or everything. Everything? Everything, yeah. How, so, you, how does it work? Well, basically, how does it work? It basically uses all the, all the services that are out there already. So from, from uh, speech recognition to, to language translation, whatever is there. And then that's the moment when you realize that you know, some languages don't give a good match, you know, the results are bad. So uh, we have another project, and this is now my favorite right now, it's called Newsbridge. And here the idea is to basically make life at Deutsche Welle easier. Because imagine you have a, an Arabic editor who has this scoop. And so the Arabic, you know, editors are having a huge party because that's the scoop. But none of the other editors do understand that as a scoop because we don't speak 30 languages. So it might be quite useful to get this kind of content out to the others as quick as possible without having, of course, that's all manual labor. So uh, imagine if you're a journalist and you have this great interview and you want others to share it and then you start transcribing it. I mean, is there a job which is more painful than transcribing an interview? You know, like, I do remember there was this one good sound, but you keep on typing it off. And so it, it's kind of, it's rather we're trying to get the, the, the strain or the pain points off, off the journalist, and that's how we, how we, how we use it uh, internally. Is this translation tool accurate? How, how do you know uh, that, that it's accurate and it's well, let's put it, I mean, job? Yeah, I mean, how do we know? I mean, we have Because people, Google Translate is not accurate. Right, so. I mean, we have, we, have, we have people from 60 different nations working at Deutsche Welle. So, of mm. course, each and every individual at Deutsche Welle is 10 times better than this, this, you know, this tool, this machine right now. Of course, so they can easily detect the mistake. But it helps them, and for some languages, the translation is already so good uh, that it's quite, or the transcription in, in the beginning is already so good uh, that it takes the strain away. So they say, well, I just have to correct a couple of words instead of typing the whole thing. And then I just push a button and, it gets, and I get it translated. Translation is not perfect yet, mm. but it's good enough and it's, it's, it helps my work. And so we use a lot of Deutsche Welle data, meaning our content, to train these AI uh, machines. That's what they still are, right? So we train the programs to become better. And we realize that for some types of content, content that we use, they have become extremely useful. 
So our editors are super happy because they say, well, it, it saves some time it, and, and leaves the time for what really counts to get a good investigative story. Because I mean, let's not forget, we, we all live in a world where the news ecosystem is just, we, we're all being drowned in, in too much information. And it, it's not an issue of getting more information. It's trying to sift through the information, filter the information, find out what's relevant. And the more information is out there, the harder it gets. And I guess there were so many panels yesterday and today of, of journalists talking about this. I just don't know how to deal with this anymore. I'm just so tired. I, help me, give me tips to, to become resilient. You know, how do I do this? And well, I'm not saying this is a cure-all, and I'm not saying I'm, we are the super fans, but let's at least try and check it out. Let's be as open-minded as, as, as we can be. So, I mean, you won't know until you know. And that's, I think, is the, is the right approach to, to, to do it right now. And of course, as you all know, Germans are super adventurous people. So we break any rules. <laughs> Talk to us. Yeah. Uh, with this transcription tool, uh, because there are out there a few applications like Treat or Habitscribe, uh, if you have used them to improve your tool, then it would be useful and also kind of a business model for you to, to release it and share it uh, with people, Absolutely. maybe well, for a fee, a small amount. No, absolutely. Of money. I mean, this is this is this is how we work. For example, for Truly Media. So Truly Media is we've developed it as, as part of a funded project, and this is now widely uh, it, it's been it's been open. So we have partners like Amnesty International who said, well, you know, it's super important for us to to fact check whatever we print in our world, you know, in our yearly annual reports. So it is important for us that there are no mistakes in there. So we'd rather take or use a, a, a tool to to help us fact check. Or we have huge public broadcasters in Germany uh, who said, well, you know, all the stuff with, these, with English and other languages is not important, but the stuff that just relates to German is good for us. And because it basically opens up a different idea. You know, boundaries have blurred already, but here you can really open up and, and help people to access tools which are there already, but you just need to know. And you, mm -hmm. you, you need to become less of an expert to debunk fake, you just have a long list of tools which are there. And so it's, I guess, in, it's in both interests. It's the interest of the journalist that these tools work, and it's the interest of those who provide these tools that these are efficient. So yeah, and so we, we, are, very, very, we are very open, and I, I guess as, as so much that's true for most of the partners. But let's not forget, if a partner is Google, they might have a different take on how to finally have a business model out of this than, than Trint, for example. So, but this is still early stage here. Yeah. And since when are you using these AI tools in Deutsche Well, when, it, when if, if you consider Truly Media and the chatbots and stuff being the first, then we started about a little bit over two years ago to, to, to develop them, use them, test them, stop using them, make our mistakes, <laughs> fail, fail forward, try to be <coughs> as agile as you can be as a public broadcaster. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's still an ongoing process. So, but, but right now, and that, that is important for us to get only, not only feedback from the users uh, for whom we do this, uh, but as well for, from our journalists. Because uh -huh. the, the moment they, they start becoming an opposition because they feel, oh, this is taking my job, you know, so it's really, it, it takes a lot of explanation in a bigger organization to say, well, it takes a strain away, it takes pain points away in certain points, but it will not replace you. So I fully agree, I mean, the, human, the human is sure. in the loop and needs to be in the loop, otherwise it's, it's, it's wrong. Yeah. Can I raise a topic that I think it's kind of important of right now? You were talking about the, the machines that actually are able to write full articles by themselves. Mm -hmm. I think there's something that is happening in Spain. There's a company that uh, has, well, serves that service to some uh, newspapers. And I think there's something that we're doing wrong when we don't tell our audience that an article has been written Absolutely. Mm -hmm. by a machine. Because in the end, the reader doesn't make a difference, right? Between what's been written by a journalist and what's been written by a machine by itself. And we're lowering the importance of our job somehow if we don't advise them. Like, this might have errors because it's not been done by a human. Yeah, and yeah. who do you hold to account? If, if a machine was writing this. I mean, there's, there's a tons of, of ethical questions that, that need to be solved. Yeah, and so transparency is, is, is definitely key. Yeah, that, that yeah. was one of the like, topics that we were going to, to <laughs> really okay. jump in the running of it. So, Taifan, we can continue in, in that topic. So, you said there are a lot of ethical uh, concerns to, to raise, as for instance, apart from this 
human uh, or machine thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what else do you think is, is worth considering in terms of ethics? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, and that, that's the, the major part. It's if, if journalism has an issue with credibility, how can you be a credible, a credible source if you're not telling who, who the writer is, if you're not transparent in this? So that, that is, the, the, for me, the number one issue. Um, and then, you know, all the other stories that, that tie in, what if there is a mistake? And you can't just lean back and say, oh, sorry, the mistake was done by a machine. Hmm. It's not the machine's fault. I mean, it's not our fault. We just, you know, wash our hands and that's it. So I, I think these are the core <coughs> questions when it comes to, to, to the ethical side Everyone. for me. Yeah, I agree with that, definitely. And, well, in, in our case, uh, everybody, uh, or everybody, I mean, most of our readers knew that uh, who were behind the project. Uh, and uh, we, we announced that in our website and in our Twitter account, actually, in the first few days. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's something that we are super aware of. And we are now, precisely as I said before, uh, going to a model that is uh, more like conversation build, conversations built by the journalists themselves and uh, identifying the author of the conversation instead of uh, just uh, doing conversations like um, done by the chatbot, you know? And I think that's interesting and it's an interesting model. And it, I mean, I, I think about it in the same way as other um, news organizations like The Conversation, for example, or others that uh, take uh, experts and um, will let them write articles about the, the research that they are doing or the topic that they are um, more um, knowledgeable about. Uh, we would like to emulate that, not just with journalists, but also with academics, like explaining a topic which is in the news, uh, people doing fact-checking, as, as we said before. And, and the other thing that we would like to do is um, transform what is today like a more uh, ephemeral experience. I mean, we send a conversation today, but we send a conversation tomorrow, and if you haven't done the conversation that we uh, sent the day before, you cannot do it. It's a little bit like uh, the stories in Instagram or, or, or Snapchat. Um, so we are, yes, yeah, so we are turning from that model more into a more, uh, um, I would say, like a more Wikipedia model in the sense that we would like to build like more um, uh, consistent, more um, uh, durable uh, conversations, you know, we would like uh, the readers to have the uh, possibility, the chance to uh, read the conversations at any time, uh, even if it's a conversation that would, a conversation that we have built like a month ago or something, that they can search for it in a way inside the chatbot and that they can just know about the topic. And that gives us the opportunity to do other things like uh, narrative series with several episodes about a topic. Um, those are the kind Bless of things you. that we would like to do, yeah. yeah. And what, what cannot be automatized? We were talking a bit uh, about it before. Hmm. Well, just a quick, quick one before we get to this. I, I believe we have to be very clear that code is, 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 is never free of values and is never free of any bias. Mm -hmm. of and, and I mean, look at me, I'm you know, being a grumpy white male, right? So these are the guys who usually program these. So how do we make sure that the bias that I have, the bias that and my prejudice and all of this just not, doesn't go into this? So I think, and this is something where I would hold us as journalists to account and say, well, listen, before using this and being super happy about how, how, how it eases your work, are you fully aware of what it does? So what kind of filtering process does it provide you with? Or is it just, I mean, is it just a lovely and nice, very sophisticated filter bubble that I'm creating because I don't know what it pulls out and what it finds relevant? So who defines relevance? I can't just lean back and well, because before I said, you know, so too much information. Well, if then the machine comes in, fine, I'll make it easy for you. Out of 500 pieces, these are the five relevant ones. If I'm not aware how this decision-making process has been programmed or made, who am I then to, to tell you, well, these are my, this is my pick here. And even if I say, well, it comes from a machine, I would love to tell people, what is it? What are the rules this, this machine has, has used? To be, and to be very open on this is, is one of the, I think, one of the, the challenges because it requires a, a skill set in the newsroom that is not there yet. I think it's not only that you have to be transparent on 
what are your source, sources for the data, but also that the sources are good because you can be transparent about having a, like very biased sources. Then, then, then which leads to the question: What is a good source? I mean, <laughs> and who defines what is good quality and what isn't? And you know, there you go. Well, yeah. <laughs> That, that, that's a topic for a, yeah, another, another panel. Another that's another <laughs> with philosophers, and I can go uh, really long. Uh, but yeah, that, that's an important question in, in terms of ethical <laughs> concerns of, of yeah AI. Um, and yeah, yeah, so I was uh, yeah kind of introducing this new topic about what cannot be automatized. Um, what is your view? That's an interesting question. I think, I mean, we are in, in a very early stage, I think, in artificial intelligence, and I wouldn't say, I, I would never say nothing, you know, because we have seen many things uh, uh, done by robots uh, by now, and there are many predictions about robots taking over jobs and so on. But uh, at least in the case of chatbots, which is with, what I know a little bit more, I think we are... Um, I mean, it's going to be a long time uh, before we see um, some kind of conversational, uh, yeah, some kind of conversational robot or whatever you want to call it that uh, does the job uh, pretty well, at least in terms of journalism. And I know that there are companies that are experimenting with that, especially IBM in the US, but I don't think it's going to be uh, something that is going to be invented by, by journalists or by a news organization. We are going to get the tools and the things that have been, have been developed by the big tech companies. And of course, we should, be, um, uh, we should be aware of those and we should be uh, agile enough to incorporate that into our reporting processes and, and into our um, work. Uh, but I don't think we are going to be at the forefront of that. We just have to um, uh, to be aware of them and, and use them um, um, as, as much as we can. Of course, at the beginning, it could be expensive and probably clunky. Uh, and that's at least the way uh, we see it right now. But, um, but of course, we don't renounce uh, to use it at some point, And we still have a small um, natural language progress, uh, process uh, tool in our bot. Uh, but I don't think they are ready yet. But, but I think the process for um, writing an, an article, like an in-depth news piece, um, so the process is you as a journalist have mm. sources or you find the right sources mm. and you interview them. Uh, but like these, these systems are fed by information that is already out there. So they're not going to get new information unless mm. they call a source mm. and, and they transcribe everything the, mm. the person is saying. So I don't think this, is, this can be mm. automatized. I think these kind of things, they, they cannot do it. It's yeah, I mean, yeah, so leather reporting and, you know, the kind of uh, work that you have to do with sources uh, on a daily basis, I don't think that's going to be automatized. Uh, machines can be very helpful to, uh, you know, to, to, to know what's in databases and things like that, but, but of course, um, uh, the reporting, the usual reporting job is not going to be automatized, neither is it, is it going to be automatized, the kind of um, writing a long-form article. I don't think we are not going to see that uh, in the next few years, definitely. And, and what about, what about fact-checking? Uh, do you think, Lara, that this the whole process uh, could be automatized? I don't think that the whole process can be automatized because when you're fact-checking, in the end, you're fact-checking humans. If, if we were fact-checking machines, it'd be much easier <laughs> because they follow processes. Humans just don't. There's like a huge difference when you're fact-checking a politician hmm. if one single word in the sentence changes. Only a word may, may, may make something that is fact-checkable, not fact-checkable. So it's not so easy and you need like human expertise for that. Even though it should be like, since fact-checking has a methodology, anyone would think, well, this should be something that a machine could do. Because we have like an exact process for every uh, fact-check that we do, but then you're fact-checking humans in the end. <laughs> that, that, that's interesting, I say it's a good. 
sentence, I like it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, I'm wondering, because I know there are a few artificial intelligence, machine learning systems uh, that are being used for fi finding, I know you don't like this term, but fake news, disinformation. Uh, and th there's one that is 76% accurate in finding uh, this kind of pieces, but the point is that the most relevant ones, the ones that are uh, that look like more real uh, because they contain real facts and they combine real facts with non-real facts and not true facts, uh, those are the ones that are harder and are having more impact. Yes, and furthermore, again, I understand that you can do that mechanical work if you have uh, somewhere where you can uh, source openly, like Twitter, and that works for countries like the United States, and they have machines doing that, and, or the UK, or people that actually have a lot of presence in Twitter. But that doesn't happen in Spain. So out of our experience, in the end, when the machine actually picks that up, we already know that that's going on because someone sent it to our WhatsApp service. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing that we've learned in the past year is that, at least in Spain, I get to I'm really, I think we need to make that difference because, for example, in Spain, a lot of people use WhatsApp and in other European countries, not so much. Um, we've discovered that this information, usually, unless we're talking about a URL, when we're talking about images or videos or audios, it starts in WhatsApp and then it gets to gets to Facebook, and after that gets to Twitter. So we're, if we're only monitoring Twitter, we're gonna get there very, very late. Well, I guess what, what, what the machines do take away are these three Ds, right? When it's, when it's dirty, when it's dull, when it's difficult, they can come in and help. The moment you, you're talking about creativity, mm, mm. it might simulate creativity when it comes to intuition. I mean, all these things that, that make up for a good journalism as well. If you try to do your research, talk to people, what is it that you sense, what is it that you feel? And of course, the direct contact with a human being, as you, as, you, as you said. And then imagine I'm doing my, I have to do, give a judgment, an opinion. I mean, anything that cannot be sort of been given in a, in a very structured mm -hmm. manner. Mm -hmm. I find it very hard right now to, um, to imagine that this is happening. At the same time, um, I have seen a couple of things on the, on the let's say, on the, on, that I, as you said before, that I would not have imagined two years ago, and now they are there. So, but, but still, um, my, my feeling is, um, so far, I'm not afraid that any machine will come in and say, well, I'm much more creative than, than your journalists. Well, more than creative is like, I'm sorry, I'm mm. Clara. Yeah. No, it's, I was just going to say that um, majority of the media, maybe not, it's not the case of Deutsche Welle, but they have an editorial line, so they have to editorialize and how to do with a machine. I well, wonder that. I think that's what Guido said, like, you build a machine with opinions. Yeah. Whenever you build it. Yeah, but if you want to say something your... specifically about a fact that is happening right now, how you ensure that the machine so, is selling exactly what you want to say? One of the ways that say. where you how you introduce editorialized content is, for example, by calling certain things one way and not another. That's something you can tell a machine to do. Mm -hmm. sure. I mean, I I don't think that's uh, like the difficult task. Another thing that I that I think that could be applicable with AI, AI in the very long future is uh, to transform text into multimedia uh, consuming. For example, to get an article and make it um, stories in Instagram, that sort of thing. So, um, I'm sorry, I, have, I just was having this note because I want to open the, the, the floor for questions for, for you guys. Uh, so, yeah, first question there, second question there. Good. Do we have a microphone? Yeah. Coming. I think it's coming. Yeah. It's coming, yeah. Um, and um, uh, sorry, uh, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm a <laughs> French student in uh, journalism. And uh, I'm very interested by sports journalism, and I have a question about, about that and IA. Um, do you think uh, IA can uh, probably in the future totally change the world of sport journalism and O? Well, yeah, when it comes to results, we would program it so Germany would be the World Cup winner 
for eternal time. No, for eternity. But no, besides that, I mean, when it comes to results, that's what's already out there. And that's very easy. You know, no one wants to go in a 2-1, 2-2, uh, or two, two, oh, a draw. And, and that's something you can, it's already out there. It's yeah. been programmed. And it takes, again, it takes this, the burden of, oh my God, I wanted to drink and here's the, the goal and I have to type in and I'm two, two minutes late or whatever. That's, that's done already. So that part taken aside. But hey, but the good interview with the sports player, the, the football player, so what did you feel when you scored? And he goes, uh huh? I mean, this cannot be simulated. No, all I'm saying is, I mean, the, the moment you really go into research and, and get the, the in-depth stories, behind stories. Yeah, yeah I, I actually follow the Real Madrid. I'm a Real Madrid fan. So I follow Real Madrid through a Telegram bot. And the Telegram bot sends me messages every time Real Madrid or its rival scores a goal. And they also send me the videos and everything. So that's a great example. And then, as Guido said, you can you know, use your time as a journalist just to do creative stuff. And for example, statistics, uh, and statistics connected to the TV so that you see, that's already automated. Yeah. There's no one typing. <laughs> but it, it can totally change the, the work of, uh, of a sport journalist. Uh, about uh, to uh, to make a good uh, a good report. I know there are uh, now machines to do some uh, reports of uh, of a football uh, football uh, uh, match. But it's um, there is a when you are sport journalist, there is a, a kind of um, uh, emotion uh, analyze. Uh, maybe a machine can can give. Imagine Barcelona scores against Madrid. Do you think that if Eduardo was a bot, it was just a goal? What? If Eduardo was the writer, this would have been it. The black hole, you die, you... That's a very bad example, yeah. I would say. Yeah. <laughs> I think a machine analyzing this kind of language, it can imitate it. I'm not sure if yeah. it's not... Yeah, but it's more like happen. a creative reporting, the kind of profile yeah. of Messi with many sources. I mean, that's something that you can, you know... Uh, get and probably the machine so far can't, you know. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. So there's one question here, one question there, another question there. And I think that's gonna be all because we don't have them. There, 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 no. No. There. <laughs> no. <laughs> sorry, he was first. Do you know I'm this sorry. guy? <laughs> Hopefully we're about to ask the same question. Um, I, I was struck, Guido, when you were saying you're telling journalists about it removing pain points. Um, and there's almost like a PR comms job to be done with journalists to kind of put them at ease. Um, and Mark Little, uh, who's actually here at the festival, I don't know if he's in this room, actually really described it well. He was the, he's the founder of Storyful. Um, and when he was there, he described the algorithm that worked for uh, user-generated content as being 90% algorithm, but the last 10% was done by a human being, a.k.a kind of a, a, a journalist, and I think that puts the journalist at ease and it puts people you know, outside at ease as well. How do you kind of convince journalists in your newsroom that they're not going to, 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 to lose their jobs and this is beneficial to them? Are, are there any, and this to the whole panel, what, what tips, what, what um, things do you say to them? Thank you. Yeah, well, it was, it was exactly the, 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 the discussion we, we had and there was uh, much more than just a concern. It was, it was basically, when we started playing with this, we started in, in, on, on a test ground. And, and one of the first questions I received was uh, by representatives from our trade unions who said, you are taking our jobs away. And then in reverse, I said, why don't we sit down, you look at what, they, what these machines do, and you tell me who is challenging this machine that he says, yeah, I really want to transcribe this interview. So as long as that is the case, um, as long as, as, as I say, and this is truly a, a pain in the neck for, for most to, to do that kind of work, or, you know, translation is hard. And if you find assistance, machine assistance that, that does it not entirely for you, but makes it easier for you, the, the moment they, an editor understands, hey, this is okay, this is actually pretty good, it helps me. Or when, I think when AP in 2014, when they started their, their financial bot, they say it saves 20% of, to, of, the, of the, the journalist's time. I don't know whether that figure is true, but obviously whenever you talk to AP journalists, they are not, they are not you know, getting their knives out and say, I want to kill that bot. They basically say, well, it's okay because it takes that kind of work that was dull anyways. So I think, but it really has to be, you, you have to have examples. 
and these examples have to have to have a lot to do with with the uh, with the work that the journalists do. The moment this is a theory, well, then I'm against it because I just don't know what is coming. So mm, yeah, yeah, and yeah. also the things that you can do now that you that you can't uh, do before. I mean, we I think that's one of the things. Um, in our case. Um, we can reach a younger audience than a newspaper, like most of our audience are under 30s, and that's a very good thing for any journalist now, for any news organization. Um, we can also send uh, personalized results in elections, so you, we can send you the, the result in your constituency, uh, and not just, you know, put you in our website and, and look for it, like, very painfully. Um, and, and the other thing is that it's a very new channel with a new language, and you can do polls, for example. You can ask your readers, what do you want me to cover? What do you want to know about this topic? That's super useful in the case of a conversational, um, yeah, bot. Cool. I have a question here. Okay. I wanted to ask about, oh, it's rather loud, sorry. Oh, sorry, uh, I forgot to tell you to, to introduce yourself, I think. Uh, did you say, yeah? Just, just to context the context. His name is John Crowley. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I'm on you did a great research, basically, <laughs> on the information overload. Yeah, the, the PR agent, right. Okay. And what about you? Uh, I'm Ollie Smith. I work for a company called Telefonica Alpha in Barcelona. I wanted to ask you to speculate and think about the future, and think about things that technology will allow journalists to do that they can't do now. So if you think about 20 years into the future. And uh, one of the reasons for that was um, actually building on the, the question from, from, the, from the sports journalism um, uh, student. I work in health, and one of the things that, that we are looking at is how you can use um, different data feeds to actually understand someone's emotion. Uh, and you can use video and text and other things to understand, is that person depressed, are they anxious, are they happy? Um, and maybe that will open up whole new avenues of, of journalism uh, that, that weren't there before. Uh, obviously, politicians are very good at hiding their feelings, uh, not always, but sometimes. But maybe you could go more in-depth into that. But that's just one example. So I want to hear your thoughts for 2039. What, <laughs> what is it going to be like? What, what's journalism going to be like? How much time do we have for it? <laughs> okay, who wants to start? I mean, I'm incapable of saying how journalism will be in five years, not in 20. But what would you like? What I would like to be in a better world that doesn't need journalism? <laughs> Why not? Yeah, it I would never happen. I wouldn't speculate about technology, but I would, what I would say is that um, as journalists, we should go beyond the article, especially as, you know, as, as newspaper or digital uh, journalists, uh, we are still very constrained by the way that we did journalists in the last couple of centuries. And, and, and the product that we do is still very much <coughs> like that. Uh, so anything that is uh, like, you know, thinking beyond the article, like uh, conversational experiences or more text-based journalism or Twitter threads or, you know, all those kind of things we are seeing that are successful because <clears throat> because they are useful for people. Sometimes people don't want to read like an 1800 uh, piece, uh, word, uh, 18, uh, sorry, 800 word piece or whatever. They just want to know what's happening. And that's the reason why the Telegram bot uh, about the Real Madrid matches is successful because it provides you a service. And I think we should think more uh, uh, about uh, along those lines. In the case of PolitiBot, I think the service we provide is just to give you once a day a small conversation, very quick. You can do it in just a couple of minutes, but uh, we kind of promise you that we are, you are gonna learn something about something important, and I think we fulfill that promise, and that's the reason we have a uh, huge retention, and people come back to the bot because of that reason. And we need to start thinking that we're gonna get into, sorry, <laughs> that we're gonna get into a much more private one-on-one -on -one conversations. That's why PolitiBot is working so much, because people are actually going back to reduce groups and reduce communities, and we need to start thinking about how do we get in there. And technology is a way of getting into that, those communities, for sure. Yeah, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't express a, a speculation, but a hope. My hope is that conferences like this will still exist in 30 years, so we still have human interaction, <laughs> going on, not just have an AI 
discussion. That, that's a very good answer, and loving it. And I'm also loving the idea of uh, targeting information to people uh, depending on their mood, their feelings in a specific moment, and what are they needing, and, and so on. I'm loving that idea. And I, me as a journalist, I'd like to have a tool that I press a button and I have got all the documentation I need for an article with the most relevant facts, with all the different angles, with the main sources, all in a list, and then everything is done. And I only have to read it and call to these people, and that's all. That's easy. I love it. And it has already booked your vacation because you have now a lot of time. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so we all go to Spain, actually, and <laughs> exactly. enjoy holidays. So I don't know how. Time for two minutes question. Is there yes. another question? I, no? I have the microphone, but I, to be honest, I think that the question well, oh. would require longer than two minutes. So I think that you had... Should I say it anyway? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you have the microphone. Right, <laughs> otherwise <laughs> we'll... <laughs> so first of all, who are you, please? So I'm, I'm Leah. I work for um, Public Broadcaster as well, um, specifically Deutsche Welle. Um, so this one's actually for Guido. Um, so you've already yes, you've already spoken. You've already spoken about how um, uh, how AI works is um, is also very much influenced by who programmed it. So my question is, we've been seeing um, you know a lot of a AI um, innovation coming out of China. To what extent do you think that um, what we've been producing over here in Europe or what has come out of USA um, is uh, as a result of you know what we've just spoken about is different? Um, between those countries, and do you think that in Deutsche Welle or in other organisations, we are in the future going to need to look at who is behind the coding, etc., to make sure we've got a very diverse panel of coders, etc.? Yeah, I'll just try to give a quick, Quickly, an yeah. quick answer to that. It's just a very, very easy question. Um, well, with regards to, to, to China, obviously, I mean, you have to be very cautious. With regards to the big tech companies in the valley, you have to be, well, very cautious. The question is, how willing are, are they to be transparent if we start giving them data to train their bots, their machines, what happens with our data? How open-minded are they to, to come back to us and say, well, we really want to improve this to make a service which is viable for you? So the point is, I think caution and transparency is something that is not so far not deeply ingrained in, in at least the work relationship that we have with Chinese companies. And we do have some issues with, with the Valley companies as well. So I, but we find it easier to, to, to talk with them. So um, I, I guess it, it is, that is definitely a, a stony path and requires a couple of wines that we can share later to, to finish up on that. Mm -hmm. Nice. So thanks so much, all of you, and of course, uh, you, your speakers. A big applause for you. Well, thank you, Esther. Applause thank to you. you. Come on. Thank you so much. Thank you.